Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be doing a tutorial in Victoria 3 on the best laws for human rights. Okay, and I'll just do a quick rundown of which ones I think are best and then we'll go into a deeper discussion about why I think the ones that I think are best are best. Alright, so for human rights, the best one is going to be, in my opinion, protected speech. For labor rights, the best one is regulatory bodies. For children's rights, the best one is compulsory primary school. For women's rights or rights of women, the best one is women's suffrage. For welfare, the best one is old age pensions. For migration, the best one is no migration controls and it's not particularly close. And for slavery, the best one is slavery banned and it's not particularly close. Now, let's get into talking about why which ones are best are best. So free speech is kind of like a sliding scale uh, for the most part. At the very bottom, you get a ton of text spread. And at the very top, you get authority and increased impact of suppression and bolstering. Now, if you're not doing a lot of suppressing or bolstering, this isn't really, the authority is not worth the text spread. Technology is really strong in this game. It lets you get comparative advantages in production by having higher tier text. For example, um, of particular note is mechanized workshops is really really strong you know early in the game uh if you get mechanized workshops early your tailors or textile mills will be extremely profitable same with like electrical capacitors which kind of does a similar thing and so when you're thinking about it it doesn't just help your you have to look at tech in terms of uh, economy as well because when you get large comparative advantages to other countries you can dump goods into their market make your places really profitable the profitability you know pays into your investment pool transfer and all these sorts of things and there's a cascading effect to having an advantage in technology which is why protected speech is so good also notably both rights of assembly and protected speech allow you to use guaranteed liberties or allow you to switch to guaranteed liberties once you have guaranteed liberties if you want you can switch back to outlawed dissent or censorship okay so these are quick things to note now why might you want to go outlawed dissent or censorship well if you are trying to heavily micromanage your interest groups which is what we're trying to do in this run uh and you want to do a lot of bolstering and suppressing both the authority will help and the increased capacity for doing this bolstering and suppressing is going to help and so it's reasonable to some light times go outlawed dissent and censorship Another thing is, when you get to the very end of the game, and you have all the technology, Outlaw Descent just looks much better, right? Uh, you, inst you are getting increased effect of suppression and bolstered, and it's pretty much a nothing burger what you get from protected speech, because you can still keep guaranteed liberties once you've passed it. The reason to kind of stay on protected speech, rights of assembly, censorship, or outlawed dis or yeah, one of these three lower ones, and not switch to outlawed descent, super late game once you have all the tech, uh, is because sometimes it just makes your interest group so mad that it's not worth swapping over to. And um, sometimes you just can't make it, you can't swing it with the legitimacy, and so this would be a reason to stay on one of the other ones. Authority tends to fall off in its usefulness as the game goes on. Uh, as you acquire more territory, edicts become kind of watered down effectively because you can't apply them to as many territories, and that's one of the main uses for um, authority. And another one is that your consumption taxes tend to be less efficient relative to just regular taxes as the game progresses. Okay, let's find Armenia, which is what we're playing as, and let's go to the next one. So for labor rights, it's important to just talk about serfdom versus serfdom abolished. Serfdom is a particularly bad law. A lot of countries start with it at the very start of the game, and what it does is it disallows... Um, laissez-faire and interventionalism, which are the two better economic systems, and it also having until you get onto it also disallows per capita taxation proportional taxation uh and uh graduated taxation all these forms of taxation are much much better and the laissez-faire and interventionalism allow you to build a lot more because you are getting a larger investment pool contribution and so construction is one of the most important aspects of the game if you are on serfdom, it is harder to construct more because you need an economic system that gives you investment pool transfer and you need a taxation system which allows you to extract wealth better from, you know, the 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 people who have a lot of money, which land-based taxation does not, which is what you have with traditionalism, generally speaking. And so this is why serfdom is particularly bad. Getting off serfdom is like a number one priority uh, for any country starting out that starts with salt or serfdom, if you can. One of the problems is it's a little bit of a, a circular problem because it empowers the landowners. Generally, the landowners oppose getting rid of serfdom. And so it can, getting rid of it can be difficult. Serfdom abolished, just vanilla. It gives nothing. 
And then we need to just evaluate these two in uh, together, and that's regulatory bodies and workers' protections. Now, in particular, I really wish these two would be bifurcated into two different law systems, because both give dangerous minus dangerous working conditions, which is pretty good, uh, and workers' protection also gives minimum wage. If you have really high minimum wage, generally you just tank your economy, because what high minimum wage, uh, combined with other factors, just real quick, what high minimum wage will do is it will increase unemployment, which will increase welfare payments. The reason being is that for any building, if we just click on a building here, um, there's an annual wage target, and if you take a look, it'll say people don't want to work here because they need a certain amount. What minimum wage does is it sets a price floor, a pr uh, floor b beyond which prices cannot go lower. So even though a person might be willing to work for less, they can't with the minimum wage laws, which instead makes them unemployed. Um, with the minute what occurs this way is there will be buildings that want to employ but they can't because they can't pay enough they can't pay the minimum wage and so you will get unemployed pops that will instead collect welfare and so you will end up having a ton of unemployed pops and also paying out a ton in welfare which is really not what you want and you'll end up having a bad time we don't have any welfare here but so this is what will happen with workers protections generally speaking if in the institution what I like to do is if I have workers protection, I'll be on like the first or second notch. And if I have workplace safety office, if I just have the minus dangerous conditions, I'll just max it out. And let's just quickly talk about the, you know, minus dangerous working conditions. So when you have dangerous working conditions, what ends up happening is you have an increased mortality rate for the pops that are working in the dangerous areas. You can kind of access this. It's a little bit opaque. One of This is one of my criticisms of the game is a lot of the systems are opaque and difficult to discern. But if you go and click on your country flag and you go to your modifiers, you can scroll down and you can look at all this. Sorry if my camera blocks a little bit of this, but you can scroll down until you find, you know, mortality of those unemployed in mind, or sorry, those employed in mines. And we have plus 20% dangerous from dangerous working conditions. So they will die at a higher rate um, as a consequence of working in the mines. And so what this means is you'll just have more people dying. And so this is a bigger effect or a more important effect uh, as you are growing more from population growth and birth rate than if you were growing from migration. The reason why is migration pulls everything towards an equilibrium. You know, as pops die, the labor becomes more scarce, which drives up standard of living because people have to pay more for the labor. As the standard of living rises, it gives more migration attraction. So if you are, if you have a lot of pops that you can pull to your market, um, having a really high mortality is not a big deal. If you can't pull a lot of pops to your market and also if labor is expensive, this becomes a very big deal. Um, so super late game when you are a very large portion of the world's population, the mortality is kind of a big deal. Um, if you scroll down even more, you can find one minus 100% dangerous working conditions. And so the, the tooltip is bugged out because it just says minus 20% from workplace safety office when it's minus 100%. And so this gets rid of all the excess, um, you know, that you have to pay. And the cost you have to pay for the regulatory bodies is, of course, just the cost to pay for the institution, which is the bureaucracy. So in this case, in this game, if we come over here, we are paying... 752 uh and it's based on your population as well as uh, your modifiers for example elected bureaucrats super late game when you have a lot of institutions is generally the best bureaucratic form because it makes all your institutions cheaper and if that is the majority of your bureaucratic cost that's good the downside is if you don't want to empower the petite bourgeoisie this does empower them and so that could be a reason to stay on appointed or hereditary or something like that okay so compulsory primary school this is non- perfectly linear but for the most part you get max education investment i think putting education investment to maximum is pretty good because it gives you uh increased qualifications as well as increased literacy the literacy gives you tech however once you reach super late game it starts to not matter as much uh you could maybe even decrease the institution and roll back the reforms i generally don't roll back the reforms because the child labor allowed gives increased mortality of farmers laborers peasants and machinists and i think this mortality rate is pretty bad even though it gives dependents income and the middle one gives something kind of in between but not perfectly in between it gives plus two mortality rate of farmers so in theory assuming this isn't a paradox math thing where this is really 2.5 but the tooltip says 2.0 um 
Restricted child labor splits the difference in a way that is, you know, favorable for you because you cut off 3% here and go to 2%. So you can make an argument for once you have all the technology, you just kind of want to roll back the education a little bit, maybe switching to restricted child labor. But for the most part, I think just staying on compulsory primary school is best because just decreasing the mortality rate, uh, I think, is a useful thing to do. But dependence income is a useful modifier because it gives dependents more money, which helps drive consumption in your economy. So um, it's kind of close once you have all the tech, but before you have all the tech, you really just want to be on increasing your literacy, which you get with compulsory primary school because it gives you more access. Also, notably, you might have something that you care about in your institution. Actually, let's go back into here. You might have something that you particularly care about that is not just uh, have to do with education access that you're getting from your school. For example, if you're doing like a religious run, it is also giving you or it is also giving you uh, plus political strength to the church and also giving plus conversion rate. So if you are running either religious schools for the conversion rate or public schools for the assimilation, um, you, again, might not want to switch off a of compulsory primary school and just think of it as being best. Also, switching back tends to make your IGs mad, so this is a reason to not do this. All right, on to women's suffrage. So this is kind of similar to a sliding scale. Uh, you will get plus birth rate at the very, very top, and... This will be good for growing your population. This is good in countries that start with really large populations. So for example, if you're playing China where you start off with just an enormous amount of pop, uh, you actually might want to stay on propertyed women. But for the most part, if you are growing primarily through um, immigration, you will want to switch to women's suffrage. Uh, and it kind of goes down this uh, route. So this, you get birth rate. If you go down, you get plus workforce ratio. So you will get if you take a look at your population, you will see that some are gainfully employed and some are unemployed and some are dependents. What this will do is it will increase the population that can be gainfully employed relative to dependents. This stimulates your economy. This is a really good modifier. And so unless you are gaining a ton of pop from growth rate, um, you want to switch to propertyed women from legal guardianship. Notably, if you even if you are getting a ton of growth from growth rate, in the short term, switching to property women will be better, uh, but having growth rate will have a lagging positive effect. Women in the workplace just continues the same trend where you are trading 5% birth rate for 5% uh, workforce ratio. Nothing to see here. And then the one that changes quite a bit is where you, cha you gain another 5% workforce uh, ratio, and then you get another chunk of what is this? Dependent enfranchisement. Now, if you look at enfranchisement, it's the fraction of uh, dependents that can join interest groups and cast a vote. Now, if you look at your pops, um, to me, it does not seem to be highly, highly uh, opaque in terms of which interest groups the dependents join. Um, you know, and this is kind of, in my mind, a little bit of a negative effect because I'm not sure which interest groups they're joining. Uh, but what it does do in my mind, or my guess, is that it helps the lower strata have more political power. You notice here, it doesn't say anything about dependents, but generally the lower strata have less money. Generally speaking, dependents have less money. This is my understanding, and so it will help, you know, the rural folk perhaps have more political power. And so women's suffrage does, it's not strictly better, but I kind of think of it as strictly better than women in the workplace because of this dependent enfranchisement. Um, Again, the game system is not very opaque in this regard. Um, or sorry, it is very opaque. It is not very transparent. And it is hard to tell exactly how this is affecting interest groups. But my understanding is it is affecting interest groups that are generally more populated by poorer people. So in this case, it would be, you know, the rural folk uh, primarily, but also the trade unionists uh, to some extent. And maybe the church. I'm not sure exactly, perhaps some petite bourgeoisie, but I'm guessing not industrialists and not intelligentsia and armed forces, maybe a little armed forces. But this is kind of a way to think about it. Um, I have not noticed an enormous effect by giving dependent enfranchisement, but, and I kind of just think of this as being strictly better than women in the workplace, and plus 15% workforce ratio is huge, so it's the best law. Okay, let's go on to welfare. Now, this one is kind of, uh, so there's a cost to every single institution. This one is an institution law. And that cost is you have to have enough bureaucrats 
to get enough bureaucracy to run the institution and this has a cost because you have to pay government wages and this cost will be this cost will increase as your population increases uh, because you will have more cost from just having more pops but it will also increase as your standard of living raises because the bureaucrats wage is based on the average wage which is based on the average standard of living and so um, this cost will be variable, but on top of that, welfare payments have an additional cost that you have to pay out, you know, in terms of welfare. We're not paying out right now, but what will happen is you'll pay out more money. And so, I think we just passed old age pension in this run, which is why we're not paying out anything currently, or I just don't have eyes. Um, but let's talk through some of these. So, as a general heuristic, no social security, main benefit, you don't have to pay money for the admin and you don't have to pay money for the institution. Poor laws, generally everyone will support poor, the transition from no, no social security to poor laws and poor laws will give welfare payments and it will also give minus 30% political strength when receiving welfare. As a general, it's kind of just going to move in the direction of giving more political strength and a little bit more benefit as you move down. For wage subsidies, it's exactly the same as poor laws, except it's not giving the minus to uh, political strength. So oftentimes, for example, if you want to empower particularly or specifically the industrialists and keep them in having a lot of clout, you want to stay on poor laws for the minus 30% political strength. Wage subsidies is kind of splitting the difference. I generally don't go wage subsidies too much, but it's like a balance between this and old age pensions. And when you go old age pensions, you get a few things going on. So. First of all, you get a minus workforce ratio. This is a bad modifier, but is offset by the increased dependence income, which will drive consumption in your economy. If you are primarily exporting a lot, and a lot of the consumption of the goods you're producing is, you know, done in other countries, this would be less of a factor. But as you grow, as you have a larger population, the increase in dependence income will be valuable for like bolstering your economy in terms of consuming consumer goods and so this becomes a very strong modifier that in my opinion is you know offsetting the wor minus workforce ratio but you will also get dependence enfranchisement notice it's the same modifier you got in women's rights where you got dependence enfranchisement my understanding is this helps the lower kind of strata uh lower rung populations become more powerful like the rural folk uh for example if you look at population, you scroll through, none of this says dependence, which is unfortunate. Uh, I do think dependents uh, do become into this group, but like, again, this is not a very transparent system, which is uh, one thing to be critical of in E, uh, not EU4, in Victoria 3. So let's talk about migration controls then. Yeah, that's the, that is the next one. Migration is just super overtuned in Victoria 3. It is by, uh, the, the, as far as law systems go, um, I think that this one is the least close in terms of what is best. Having no migration controls is best. And you, playing around the fact that you have no migration controls is really important. So if you're really, really small being inside someone's market in order to siphon off pops from them. Because the main benefit of migration is you get to suck off all the pops from other countries. Um, the, and the benefit you get from having closed borders or migration controls is you allow fewer discriminated pops into your country which is just going to increase the price of your labor increase your standard of living and uh generally speaking you just want the pops to come in and lower the price of labor so your buildings can be more competitive uh and this is as a general you you just you just want the migration if we take a look at the pop map here for a while we were trying to do a little bit in this run uh, spoilers for those who are following the Armenia run, where this little flat area was when we had uh, citizenship laws with national supremacy and racial segregation, and people didn't want to migrate here. And then as soon as we turned those off, it just shot up. All the while, we had no migration controls. So no migration controls is best, but it is also best in conjunction with having multiculturalism and total separation so that pops will not be discriminated against and so because they're not discriminated they're more likely to migrate to your country when they migrate to your country this does several things it helps drive down standard of living which is a mixed bag type of thing when it drives down standard of living it makes all the labor cheaper in your market would make which makes all of your industries more efficient um and what it also does is normally when you decrease standard of living, it kind of is not a good thing for you because you uh, increase radicals and you decrease loyalists. However, all the people who newly migrated to your country 
are going to have an increase in standard of living, which helps to offset the fact that you are getting, you know, increased radicalism and decreased loyalist. And so it really doesn't have the effect of, you know, lowering standard of living that much. And when used in conjunction with something like guaranteed liberties, which gives like minus to radicals from decreases in standard of living and plus to loyalists, you can really stack up a ton of loyalists relative to radicals even if you're allowing migration, this would be the argument against migration. Um, migration is just super overtuned, in my estimation, in a way that's not realistic. Um, not that I'm saying I'm anti-migration, I am like pro-freedom move movement in a general sense, but this basically has no negatives in terms of gameplay mechanics, which I I don't think is the case. I think that if, if pops really dislike migration, which I think some pops would, uh, it would, in my estimation, it should radicalize them, and it doesn't. So migration is just really good. It increases your population, which has a cascading effect that is really, really beneficial for you. Your economy can stall out. If you look here, this flat area where our economy stalled out is the same flat area where we have, like, this migration area thing going on, or it's a similar flat area. Um, okay, and let's go into slavery being banned. Um, if you are doing, like, I think the only reason I would want to have slavery is if I was trying to do something where I had a highly, 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 uh, stratified economy, where I was looking to have the upper strata be as rich as possible. Maybe that's a reason to do slaves as some sort of objective, but... Um, slavery is going to have several effects, and all of the slavery is going to have this uh, type of effect. It unlocks the slavery mechanic, and it just uh, puts it in in different ways. So, for example, debt slavery. I believe that anyone who is uh, discriminated against can become a slave if they become poor enough. Uh, for slave trade, it's you just buy and sell slaves. And for legacy slavery, you cannot add any new slaves to the population. But I think you can... I can't remember if you can still import them. Um, they're all slavery, and the way the slavery mechanic works is it keeps the pops at really, really low standard of living. When they're at low standard of living, this is bad in several regards. First of all, uh, migration is one of the most overtuned things in the game. Uh, migration is extremely strong. If your average standard of living is driven down by the fact that a lot of your people are slaves, you will have a hard time getting people to migrate to your country. Um, also, uh, slavery disallows, and I believe it disallows, like, multiculturalism, and, uh, yeah, it disallows multiculturalism and some of the lower rung uh, citizenship laws, which allow you to get a lot of migration as well, and slavery is also going to, uh, because the pops are getting paid very, very little in the lower strata, um, it is going to, because lower strata will include slaves, it doesn't include it in this tooltip, because we don't have any slaves, um, it will drive down standard of living and it will drive down consumption. The slaves don't get paid a lot of money. They can't consume a lot of goods. And so if you are in a slave economy, you have to export a ton. And eventually you just get so big you can't really export to anyone else. And there's nothing to drive consumption in your economy. And so this is a bad thing. Also, we pay. It's, best, it's better to have domestic um, consumption than it is to consumption overseas because you're paying costs of various kinds in order to export goods and so it's going to overall make your businesses less profitable but what it will do that you could think of as being like positive or something you could are intentionally trying to go for is it will bifurcate your economy more so your lower strata will be poorer and your upper strata will be richer if this is something you're going for in a particular run then maybe you would want slavery or you'd want to start out as a slaving country but other than that you really want multiculturalism so you can get so you can siphon off pops from all over the world and no migration controls and slavery interferes with that so you want to get rid of slavery this has been all of the ones that are best in terms of human rights i'm just going to go quickly run through them again and explain why i think that particular one is best really quick okay so rights of assembly i think is or sorry protected speech i think is best because i think the tech spread is worth worth more than the authority and it also unlocks your ability to go guaranteed libs however uh rights of assembly will also let you go guaranteed libs so generally speaking i fall in rights of assembly or protected speech on most of my runs if i want the authority i just stick on rights of assembly and this sort of thing once you get into the super late game switching back to outlawed descent is best because the tech spread becomes useless as you have all the technologies 
for labor rights. I think regulatory bodies is best. I really, really wish that uh, minimum wage was separate from dangerous working conditions. That way I could have, you know, 10% minimum wage or 20% minimum wage and 100% dangerous minus dangerous working conditions. But it's not the case. Um, so just go regulatory bodies. And of particular note, partic uh, serfdom is particularly bad because it prevents you from going to better economic systems and the better taxation systems. And so... A priority number one or the way you should construct what everything that you're doing is around getting rid of serfdom if you start on serfdom uh, oops. for children's rights compulsory primary school is best because the education institution is useful uh, for getting ahead in technology which will have cascading a positive effect for your economy because if you have an advantage in technology such as get, being the first to go mechanized workshops or electrical capacitors, this will allow you to export your goods and uh, have really, really profitable businesses, which will allow you to have bigger investment pool transfers, which will allow you to construct more. Construction's kind of what drives economies and the way you could think of as economic growth. And so for the most part, uh, going compulsory primary school is really, really strong. Uh, it will also make interest groups happy that are uh, important. Like, for example, the interest group with the best bonuses is probably the trade unions. If you take a look at their bonuses, they give you industrial organizers, which gives 10% manufacturing in industries throughput, which is bu doubled if they are a powerful interest group over 20% or over 18% if they were previously 20%. And also solidarity, which gives increased workforce ratio, which, as we discussed in feminism, is a really, really strong mechanic because it turns more of your workers into or it per turns more of your pop into workers or a higher percentage of your pop into workers which is really 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 good because the workers make more money they drive consumption and they also drive production okay in rights of women i think women's suffrage is best with the caveat that if you have an enormous population country like china birth rate might be better the reason why women's suffrage is best is because it gives a ton of workforce ratio um and also you can sometimes like the dependence enfranchisement modifier because it will help empower some of the lower rung pops although in, currently in Victoria 3, the system by which this happens is very opaque. It is difficult to understand what is happening. My assumption is, is everyone in the lower strata, these are kind of the, the people, the interest groups that the lower strata people like are going to be the same interest groups, in my estimation, that the dependents like, although there is no dependents here in the lower strata. Ooh, slaves is there. I said it wasn't, but I lied. Okay. Moving on. Welfare, I think that old age pensions is best. But it's pretty close between poor laws, wage subsidies, and old age pensions. I think old age pensions is best because it is giving uh, dependents income, which will help derive consumption in your economy, which in my in, uh, estimation offsets the workforce ratio modifier that is negative malice. But in general, you kind of want to think about it in terms of uh, the poor laws will allow you to keep the industrialists powerful, and the old age pensions will allow you to empower some of the people who are not industrialists. And this is kind of a way to look at it. They're all pretty close, though. I think. For migration controls, no migration controls is best, and it's not close. Migration is super overtuned. It's a really good way for growing your population, which is good because it drives down the average standard of living, which drives down the average wage, and as the and then in turn it resupplies you with population, which allows you to construct a whole bunch more buildings and have those buildings be profitable and then those profitable buildings rise standard of living uh which creates you know more loyalists but also the people who came with standard of living 10 from other countries and then came to your country and got a standard of living of 22 let's say uh those people are going to become loyalists from the increases in standard of living and so migration controls like drives up everything positive in your economy it makes buildings more profitable it makes labor cheaper for those buildings it still creates loyalists and a cascading effects it's super overtuned i don't think it's close i think that if you are doing migration controls or closed borders you're doing something that's inefficient and um you can you might want to do this for the sake of like certain themes of a run or rp but but no migration controls is best big caveat this is in conjunction with multiculturalism and total separation um the multiculturalism prob probably being the more important one because you can still siphon off pops from countries where you have the same religion um notably migration controls you can make an argument that you don't want to do this on like maybe one country and that's china uh and the reason for that although they start off with no migration controls i think and the reason for that is they already have an enormous population anyways but they're a bit of an outlier slavery you want to ban slavery because of a variety of effects um the it 
It pays pops very, very little, which drives down consumption and drives down standard living, which drives down migration, which is already a really overtuned mechanic. And so in general, you just want to ban slavery. Also, from an RP perspective, you might want to ban slavery for that reason. If you were doing a run where you specifically want to have a hyper bifurcated economy for whatever reason, like the memes, uh, then going slavery would be a good thing to do. But other than that, uh, you don't want to do that. For the most part, in human rights, um, you know, a lot of this has to do with... Uh, you know, empowering kind of people who are down on their luck. And the most important one is migration. Hope you enjoyed this video uh, tutorial. Uh, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, or share. And, um, you know, have a good one.